Hi, welcome to lecture number 11, in which we are going to take a look at uh, countries in Southern Africa. And uh, today we'll talk about uh, South Africa and uh, Nelson Mandela, who's a rather famous guy from the last few decades. And ones we're gonna look at are, uh, of course, South Africa. People always remember this one because it's in Africa and it's in the south of Africa, okay? It's real easy. The uh, location is found in the name. Um, tomorrow in, uh, what is it, um, lecture 12, we'll look at uh, Lesotho, a little kingdom in, surrounded by Africa. We'll take a look at Eswatini, another little uh, kingdom that uh, just recently changed its name about a year and a half ago. It used to be Swaziland, and you can still hear it called Swaziland from time to time, but the new name is Eswatini. Uh, up here we have Zimbabwe. We will talk about what a basket case that country is. And finally, we will mention in passing Madagascar over here. Okay, but today we're going to talk about South Africa. There are lots of what historians call the theory of history, lots of different ones. Uh, now, there's a whole wealth of things that goes into making our history, but some historians tend to emphasize one thing over another as perhaps being more important in the development of history. Some will say that history is determined by disease, the disease theory of history, and well, we're currently experiencing a pandemic, and yes, it has certainly affected, uh, affected history. Uh, they will look back to the Black Death and the dramatic effects that had on history. Uh, some will say climactic uh, theory of history is a real mover in history. Uh, yeah, when you get an ice age that comes down, it forces people to move. This is definitely changing history. Uh, lots of theories of history. The one that I tend to gravitate towards is called the great man theory of history. That our history is certainly affected by all these other things, but it's great men and the decisions they do uh, they make and the things that they do that really affect history. And in that regard, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Nelson Mandela and his impact on South Africa. Okay, but for now, let's, uh, let's take a look at some notes here. And I will talk about these. Let's try that again. There we go. Okay, South Africa. Well, hey, there's always been people living in South Africa. The Africans lived there. But as far as Europeans, the Dutch were the first to settle, 1652. Now, they would, uh, of course, trying to go from Europe, trying to go from Europe around Africa to get to Asia. And the Dutch dominated that trade for a long time. Um, the uh, but they realize, you know, halfway through, the other sailors are going to need some fresh water, they're going to need some fresh vegetables, uh, going to need a little food. And so South Africa is where the Dutch settled in 1652, originally just as a little trading establishment. Uh, they brought in some farmers. Uh, the Dutch word for farmer is boar, B-O-O-R, and eventually the Dutch became known as the Boers. Um, but they came in and they settled, and the farmers were thrilled with the place. Uh, back in uh, back in Holland, it's it's cold and it's gloomy and uh, it rains so many days of the year. But down in South Africa, the sun is shine, shining. The winters are mild. I uh, I spent about six weeks in South Africa during their winter, and it was wonderful. <laughs> Temperatures are in the 60s and 70s. I, I took a sweater with me when I felt like I might need it, but. Oh, well, the weather was great, the scenery was great, and so these uh, these Dutch settlers would write back to their buddies, the man, you ought to come down here, this place is wonderful. And uh, so quite a few Dutch actually uh, moved down there, and uh, the place would belong to, uh, to the Dutch for 150 years before the British showed up. 
Well, the British showed up because we have the Napoleonic Wars going on and Napoleon seizes the, the low countries where the Dutch came from. And uh, so the British said, well, this is our opportunity to take over. And so they did in 1805. And uh, the British discovered the very same things that the Dutch had discovered. Man, this is a great place. It's warm, it's sunny, the crops grow. And uh, so more and more British started to come down. Well, there was a long history of unhappiness between the Dutch or the Boers and the Brits. Um, first of all, there was the homeland rivalry. Uh, lots of Americans don't realize that at one time, uh, the Dutch or Holland had, uh, had uh, a lot of unhappiness with the British. They fought a couple of wars and uh, didn't always get along very well. In fact, uh, the Dutch were helping the Americans in uh, our war against the British. Most people don't know that, but without uh, the Dutch, you know, we may not have won that war. Most of the gunpowder the American revolutionaries used uh, came by uh, the Dutch. Uh, they had the language problem, uh, and the Brits were kind of snobs about it, okay? The Brits were running things, and they said, the official language is English. If you want to do anything official, like go to court or any of that stuff, uh, it's got to be in our language. Uh, the real killer, however, was slavery. Now, remember I talked about the British really being the first major country to do away with slavery, not just in Britain, but in all of its colonies. And by now, South Africa is a colony. So the Brits are telling the Dutch, okay, got to let those slaves go. And the Dutch saying, well, we don't think so. We need our slaves in order to run our farms. Uh, so the Dutch were not happy. Now, just a comment on the, the uh, slaves of the Dutch. Um, the Dutch originally, when they got there, tried to enslave some of the Africans. However, the Africans weren't really excited about that, and uh, they outnumbered the Dutch. They were great warriors, and uh, so the Dutch went and got their slaves uh, out, of, out of Asia. Uh, so you have a huge kind of polyglot of, of races in South Africa to this very day, and some of it uh, was the slaves that the Dutch brought in from, from Asia. Uh, so you've got uh, this big slavery problem. When the Brits try and force the no slavery, the Dutch decide, no, nope, that's it, we are out of here. And so they move east into the eastern part of what is now South Africa. They set up, set up two little countries of their own. One's called the Transvaal and one's called the Orange Free State. And uh, the British pretty much just left them alone. Uh, so, well, good, good riddance, they're out of here. We won't worry about them. And then the Dutch had the great misfortune of finding diamonds in the Transvaal and gold in the Orange Free State. And uh, well, hey, all of a sudden now the British are very interested in it. Uh, they fight two wars. Uh, and take over these areas because, yeah, now all of a sudden there's gold and diamonds to be had. To this day, they still mine and, and send out a lot of gold and diamonds out of, uh, out of South Africa. So you have uh, kind of a hassle going on between the British and the Dutch, uh, but both sides are having to contend with the black population of South Africa. Okay? Um, the black population was not treated well by either English or the Boers, come to be known as the Afrikaners. Um, the Afrikaners, that is the Dutch slash Boer, again, three names that apply to them, um, versus the English, but both of them versus the black population. And yes, there were wars fought, uh, some of them very dramatic. Um, as time went on, though, peace, uh, peace reigned, although the white population was clearly in charge and discriminated against the black population. 1923, the black population formed what came to be known as the African National Congress. This is basically a political party. Uh, the ANC still exists today. Uh, and they began to protest for, for their rights. Uh, World War II comes along, September 1st, 1939, and uh, World War II comes along. South Africa, being a colony of Great Britain, 
Uh, there are lots of uh, people that go to the fight in World War II, mostly the descendants of the English settlers, not so much the Afrikaners or the descendants of the Dutch uh, settlers. Um, in World War II, of course, just like in the United States and every other country, there was a huge need for labor. And you started to see lots of the black population coming into the cities, uh, getting jobs in the cities, uh, and getting paid much more than they had ever gotten paid before uh, because the labor was needed. Well, of course, the war ends. And in 1948, uh, they have a presidential election, which, of course, the African population is not permitted to vote in. And uh, the Dutch win the government, the, the Afrikaners, they win the election, and they immediately put into place something called apartheid. Apartheid translates as separateness, and this is the, the South African government goal, is to separate the white population from the black population and what they termed the colored population. The colored population being the descendants of those Indian slaves, those African slaves. Um, they set up a little passbook system in which your racial identity was put into this little passbook. You had to have this wherever you went, and uh, it assigned you to different places. Uh, the whites population, they were place was in the cities. Thousands of Africans and colored populations were moved out of the cities into these giant slums that uh, were would be several miles away from, from the cities, um, they were basically ousted. Some African neighborhoods that had been there for decades were totally uprooted and moved to the settlements. Uh, there were homelands created for the black Africans. Uh, think of them as, as our Indian reservations. Um, they were that told that this is your home. You can only be in the cities if you have a job and you, in your passbook, it says, yes, your employer vouches for you. And even then, you usually had to leave the city when nighttime came. Um, when I flew into Cape Town, there's something kind of interesting. You fly into Cape Town, uh, gorgeous airport. You could be in you know, any airport anywhere in any modern country in the world. Uh, and then you drive into, uh, from the airport, you have to drive quite a ways. Uh, to get into uh, to get into uh, Cape Town, and it was kind of interesting. As we started out driving from the airport, we could see off in the distance uh, the glitter, some shine of of something. And uh, I asked the driver, "What is that over there?" He says, "Oh, that's the settlements. That's where uh, the black Africans live. Uh, the sh shining off uh, the sheet metal roofs of their, of their little shacks and shanties. I later was able to get in there and visit uh, with some of those people and, and see, uh, see where they lived. And basically, it's just a giant slum. Uh, they're little houses made out of old boards and tin and, and cardboard, whatever they can get. And there are literally tens of thousands of Africans, the, the black Africans that live out there. Well, apartheid put them out there, uh, but of course they have to have jobs. And so they had to do the commute into the city with your passbook, do your job and be out of the city by a certain time at night. Um, our par apartheid was brutally repressive. Uh, it was a, a very unhappy situation. Um, and it was condemned around the world. Uh, as information got out on what was going on in South Africa, countries all over the world were, were down on South Africa, including many in the British Commonwealth and in Britain. So in 1960, the South Africans broke away from Britain. Um, they weren't even part of the Commonwealth for a while there. They were just, they were on their own. Well, they came in for a lot of condemnation, but not a lot of official sanctions against them. Because remember, this was back during the Cold War between the communists and the capitalists, between the East and the West. 
uh, communism was trying to take over many parts of Africa, including Angola. Uh, the, there were 50,000 Cuban troops stationed in Angola uh, trying to take over Angola and all the other countries around it, including attacks into South Africa. Well, South Africa had a very modern military, a very formidable white force, and they were seen as a bastion against communism. And so where lots of people weren't happy with what they were doing, they weren't going to criticize them too much because we needed them in the anti-communist effort. Well, 1991, of course, the Soviet Union falls apart. Communism is no longer a threat. The Cubans have all gone home. And all of a sudden, South Africa gets even more pressure to do away with this apartheid system. Pressure came in a lot of different ways. Uh, people would boycott any product from South Africa. South Africans were having trouble selling things. Um, college campuses erupted in these protests, trying to force colleges uh, that had large endowments to divest themselves of any investments in South Africa. That is not to take the, the college's money and invest it in the uh, stock market in anything that would benefit South Africa. Uh, one of the biggest things was South Africa was banned from lots of uh, international sports. And uh, for the white population in South Africa who are very sports minded, uh, this was kind of a slap in the face. And anywhere the South Africans would travel around the world, they were just kind of, kind of looked at askance and, and uh, realized they weren't very popular around the world. Uh, eventually, all of these boycotts, all of this, this trouble is affecting the economy, affecting the white population. And there was always an element of the white population was uncomfortable with what was going on. And eventually, apartheid was ended. And uh, I kind of address that because I want to talk about Nelson Mandela. Uh, Nelson Mandela is the most important name in South Africa. He was born in 1918, a little tiny village uh, in the east, uh, eastern part of South Africa. Uh, his father uh, was probably middle class uh, by their standards but had kind of an enviable position. Uh, he was viewed as being one of those who was very wise, and uh, he um, was a counselor to the king. Now, uh, Mandela was born into the Matiba clan, which was part of the Thimbu uh, tribe. And uh, so Mandela's father was a counselor to the king of the Thimbu people. Uh, Nelson Mandela, as a young kid, he ran around herding the, the cattle, uh, ran around barefoot in a loincloth, and uh, stick fought. That was the big thing when, in, that, uh, in his childhood with all the other children. Uh, however, his father had better plans for him and insisted that he get some education and insisted that he work very hard. Well, that was the big thing about Mandela. He was a hard worker and did, uh, did fairly well with his, with his school because of that hard work. Well, at age 12, his father died. Um, and uh, Mandela writes in his biography about uh, how sad everyone was, but a few days after his death, uh, Mandela's mother said, come with me, you are going to live with the king. And uh, they walked for all day to get to where the king's palace was, and his mother dropped him off. and said, good luck, <laughs> all of this at age 12. Well, it uh, could have been scarring for, for some to be separated by your mother and thrown into a strange household, but uh, South African society among the, the, the natives, uh, basically it's a very tight knit uh, family sort of a thing and he had family there. Um, well, he uh, is being uh, the king had told uh, Mandela's father that he would, when men, it was apparent Mandela's father was going to die, that he would take him in and see that he got educated. So Mandela begins working uh, at the king's house, uh, and he's treated like just one of the, one of the kids. Uh, he has his jobs to do, either herding the cattle or doing other things, but 
he is being reared to be a counselor to the future king. And so he is given educational opportunities of which he makes the most. Um, he's a, by all reputation is a very hard worker. He uh, gets through the equivalent of uh, their high school and he is accepted at a rather prestigious um, a college, university, not too far away, and he goes there. However, he does run into some problems at the college. He joins student protest, and uh, the president of the university calls him in and said, you need to, uh, to back away from these issues, otherwise you will be expelled. And it was right at the end of, uh, end of the school year, and says, you go home, you think about it, um, you either back away from these positions or you or don't bother to come back. Well, when he gets home and tells his uh, stepfather or his, uh, his ward, the, the, not ward uh, the king, the king is outraged and says, yes, you will back off from those protests. Um, and then he drops kind of a bombshell. He said, I, uh, I am ill and uh, not expected to live too much longer. And before I go, I have to see you settled. And so I've arranged for a marriage for you. Whoa, you've arranged a marriage. You picked a, picked a wife for me. This is very unsettling to Mandela, who I get the feeling was kind of a rebel when he was a kid. Uh, and he decides, no, I'm not having anything to do with this. I'm not backing off my protests. I'm there at the college. I'm leaving. And so he runs away, <laughs> runs to the big city of Johannesburg. Um, and when he gets there, he has some interesting adventures uh, until finally he, uh, because of his good education and his having had some college, uh, he gets a, a job with a law firm. Now, obviously not as a lawyer. Uh, he's doing little clerical duties, but he's kind of a go-between between between the white lawyers and their black uh, uh, clients. Um, does some stuff with real estate and different things that he's involved with, but uh, he discovers that he likes this idea of being a lawyer. So he is working for this firm, and he's going to school at the same time, some of it correspondence. He finally gets his, uh, his BA while he's working there at the law firm. Uh, then he continues to uh, study the law, mostly, on, we would say online, but it was correspondence, and uh, finally becomes a, a lawyer, one of just a handful of black lawyers at the time. Now, during this time, he joins the African National Congress, the ANC. Um, his employers were not happy about it. In fact, he kept it a secret from them for quite a while. Uh, but he gets very active in the ANC and protesting and demonstrating for the end of apartheid and for the, uh, the equality of the races. Uh, he is arrested for his membership in the ANC and tried for treason. 1961, he's found not guilty. Um, but as the repression grew in this apartheid system, uh, within the ANC, the ANC at first had been totally nonviolent. And uh, Mandela was believed in nonviolence. He was a big fan of Mahatma Gandhi, who had led the uh, resistance to the British in India and had used totally nonviolent techniques. But as the repression became so great, when we had the Sharp Bell Massacre, where uh, the South Africans just slaughter unarmed uh, uh, Africa, black Africans, uh, he comes to realize that, you know, South Africa is a different situation from India, and we need to respond with some kind of, uh, some, some kind of armed conflict. Uh, so he is made the head of the militant wing of the ANC. It's called the tip of the spear, kind of a dramatic name. But even when he does this, he, become, he tries to keep it nonviolent. He discovers that the best way to send a message to the white population is to deny them electricity. Um, it is also uh, transformers and uh, power stations are easy targets. There's usually nobody around. Uh, it's easy to blow them up and it uh, affects a large amount of the white population. It doesn't affect the black population too much because the blacks don't have, uh, don't have electricity. 
Um, and so this becomes a favorite target. But even with their bombings, they would always plant the bomb, call ahead and say, you've got 10 minutes to get out of there. It's about to explode. And uh, this is what, uh, what he gets involved with. Uh, eventually, he is arrested. 1963, he is tried for sabotage and convicted, given a life sentence at a place called Robbins Island. Now, Robbins Island is in the harbor of Cape Town. I got to visit it when I, when I was there. It, uh, it's kind of, kind of desolate. Um, and uh, he basically was sentenced to life imprisonment there at Robbins Island. It was a fairly brutal experience for him. Uh, they worked in some quarries there, mining something that was so shiny and bright that uh, he had affected his eyesight for the rest of his life. Uh, he spent time in solitary. Um, but he remembers this, this time, even with its difficulties, as being, as being a good time. What he did was kind of transform what was a prison into a school. Because as other uh, Black African resistance people were, were captured and, and sent to the island, he saw to their political education. They would come in angry and hateful of the government and wanting to, to basically kill all the whites and throw them out of the country. And Nelson would talk to them, calm them down, and says, no, you don't want that. If we run out the white population, they are going to leave with their expertise, their know-how. Uh, they're going to take as much as their finances as they can, and the country will be that much poorer. In order to thrive economically and to make our country what it can be, we need the white population, their knowledge and their resources. And at first, these, these angry young men would just get all uptight about it, but Nelson would win them over. He's a fairly charming guy by all accounts. He would win them over, convince them that what he was saying was right. Now, Mandela was in there for life, but as these people would leave um, that have come under his influence, they carried the message to the rest of South Africa that, yes, Mandela is still with us. Mandela, these are the things he believes. He is very much for equality. And they keep his name alive throughout the black population. Not only keep it alive, but he comes to become kind of a, a, a folk hero. Um, he does another interesting thing while he is in prison. He learns Afrikaners. Now, and we had the Dutch, the Boers, they become known as the Afrikaners. They have developed their own language. In the 150 years that they lived in South Africa before the British came along, they had developed their own language. It's a mixture of Dutch, it's a mixture of English, it's a mixture of some of the African words. It is a mixture of some of the slave words from the slaves that they, that they brought in. Afrikaners becomes this distinct language. Uh, so in, in uh, South Africa, you have two major languages. You have English and you have Afrikaners, and then you have all the different tribal languages. Well, Afrikaners is viewed as the language of the oppressor, but Nelson Mandela teaches himself Afrikaners. Gets a lot of flack for it from others. You're learning the language of the oppressor, but no, he learns that language. He says, when this inequality ends, and it will end, he never lost faith that it would. When it ends, we are going to need that white population. You can talk to another person through a translator and you can touch his mind, but only if you can speak his language can you touch his heart and his soul. So he learns the language. Well, by uh, 19, the early 1960s, the pressure on South Africa, I'm sorry, the uh, early 1990s, uh, the pressure on South Africa is just becoming immense. And the white population is starting to think, you know, the country can't not go on this way. Well, we have then a, a Afrikaner guy named F.W. de Klerk. F.W. de Klerk is a politician, and uh, he is elected president. F.W. de Klerk, in his journal, talks about a religious experience he had in which he, as he describes it, 
I seem to feel almost to the point of someone telling me that I would be the person that brings change to this country. And when he came in, he began to have little secret negotiations with Nelson Mandela on doing away with our apartheid, on changing the constitution of South Africa, and basically giving every man the vote. Uh, Nelson Mandela is, is part of this, and uh, eventually they work out an, an agreement. Nelson Mandela is released in 1990, and a new constitution is put in. Um, Nelson Mandela and F.W. de Klerk in what was it, 1993 get uh, are jointly given the Nobel Peace Prize. 1994, they have the first election under the uh, the new constitution, where every person can vote. And of course, Nelson Mandela is elected president. Overwhelmingly, even lots of the white people voted for him. Um, there was not a huge white flight. This had been the fear that if the Constitution changed, if the blacks come into power, that the whites will take everything they can and leave. Some did, most did not. And the reason they did not was Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela that preached and practiced nonviolence. Nelson Mandela that learned the language of the oppressor. Nelson Mandela that begged the white population to stay, that promised them their stuff would not be taken. This was the fear the whites had. They're going to take our stuff. We have been brutalizing the black population for decades. They are going to kill us. They are going to drive us into the sea. They are going to take our stuff. Nelson Mandela said it will not. And people came to trust him. And in fact, that is what happened. He became president. There was no massive white flight. There was no killing whites in the streets. It was a peaceful transfer of power. Nelson Mandela served for one term, and then uh, he, he retired. He was in, in poor health. I uh, died in uh, 2013. Um, in fact, while I was over there, everyone thought he was going to die. And uh, oh my gosh, people were beside themselves with grief. People were crying on the sidewalks. Uh, he didn't die until uh, a couple years later, 2013. Um, but because of what this one man did, there was a peaceful exchange of, of power. And you had the South Africa, instead of being economically devastated, you had it continue on. Now, South Africa still has problems. Um, there is still the fear in the white population. I mean, Nelson Mandela is no longer around. What's going to happen? Um, but, and everybody, I, every white person I met there had some kind of an exit strategy if things got bad. Uh, they have sometimes actually sent their children abroad to build a life in another country just in case things get bad in South Africa, the family can join the son or the daughter. Many have established dual citizenship in other uh, English Commonwealth countries. Um, there's still the nervousness. There's high crime there. There's lots of poverty there. There's huge inequality there, but it is a democracy. And for that, we have largely Nelson Mandela to thank for it. Uh, in our next lecture, that will be election, or lecture 12, I want to contrast uh, South Africa with uh, what goes on in some of the other countries and develop this theme of the uh, great man theory of history a little bit more. So, hey, thanks for being with me. Have a great and wondrous day.